Hello and welcome once again to Bible Class Topics. Today we start Lesson 2 of our discussion of the letter to the Hebrews. We've titled this lesson, Better Than the Prophets. If you have your Bibles, you might want to get them out. Turn to Hebrews chapter 1 with me. And we're going to read three verses to get started. Long ago, at many times and in many ways, God spoke to our fathers by the prophets. But in these last days, he has spoken to us by his Son, whom he appointed the heir of all things, through whom also he created the world. He is the radiance of the glory of God and the exact imprint of his nature, and he upholds the universe by the word of his power. After making purification for sins, he sat down at the right hand of of the majesty on high. We'll be talking about these three verses in our study today. Meanwhile, let's take a quick look at our little miniature outline of the book of Hebrews. It's in three parts, the three superiors. The first superior is Hebrews teaches us of a superior person, and that person, of course, is Jesus Christ. Secondly, Hebrews teaches us of a superior priesthood, and that is a priesthood after the order of Melchizedek. And finally, the book of Hebrews teaches us of a superior principle, and that is the principle of faith. The writer of this letter wants us to know that it is through Jesus Christ alone that we may see the full revelation of God and be brought into God's very presence. Jesus Christ is this superior person, and he's better than the prophets, he's better than the angels, he's better than Moses, and he's better than Aaron. And this is not to say that these other people and beings were not good. The prophets were good. The angels were good. Moses, Aaron, were good. But Jesus Christ is superior to any of these people. Also, you'll note three asides that we'll cover here in chapters 1 through 6. We'll talk more about those in a few minutes. We cannot misunderstand this. Jesus Christ is better than the prophets. The Hebrew writer is in no way denigrating the work of the prophets. Their work was needed. Their work was God-breathed, but taken singularly, it was incomplete. His point is that Jesus is beyond even their greatness in every respect. Look at our chart. God's original glory belongs to Jesus. God's kingdom belongs to Jesus. God's creation belongs to Jesus. God's providence, God's saving grace, God's work of intercession and mediation, all of these things do not belong to the prophets. They do belong to Jesus Christ. Let's note five characteristics of this letter that will help us enter into our study of the text. You'll notice that each of these characteristics begin with the letter E, and of course we can thank Warren Wearsby and his commentary for setting up those words in such a way that it'll help us to remember the five E's, the characteristics of the book of Hebrews. It's a book of evaluation, exhortation, examination, expectation, and exaltation. Let's talk about the Hebrew letter being a book of evaluation. A book of evaluation. Better, perfect, eternal. Better. This word better is used 13 times by the writer to show the superiority of Christ and his plan of salvation over the Hebrew system. We'll mark its use as we study through. Perfect occurs 14 times. A perfect standing before God. We will note the contrast between the sacrificial system of the law and Christ once for all time sacrifice for our sins. Eternal. What's eternal? Salvation is eternal. 
Redemption is eternal. Inheritance is eternal. Throne is eternal. Priesthood is eternal. And the Godhood of Jesus Christ is eternal. Christianity is better because the blessings are eternal and they give us perfect standing before God. The law could not accomplish what Jesus did. It's obvious that the readers of this letter were being drawn back towards Judaism. Spiritually, they were at a standstill and they were on the brink of backsliding. The letter to the Hebrews is a book of exhortation or encouragement. The writer wants his readers to believe that God has spoken to us through Jesus. We have his word. Now what are we going to do about it? The writer has interspersed five specific exhortations within the letter, each one encouraging us to heed the word. These exhortations are not addressed to alien sinners. They're addressed to reborn Christians. These exhortations are too stern to be anything but warnings against apostasy. The first one, which we'll see in chapter 2, is drifting from the word. And we're talking about neglecting. You can think of a helmsman not tending to his course as he sails across the ocean. The next exhortation is to not doubt the word. This is hard-heartedness, and this kind of doubt comes from drifting. Next, he'll exhort his readers concerning dullness toward the word. And this is sluggishness. Then, the fourth one, despising the word, which is willfulness. And finally, defying the word, which is absolutely refusing to hear. So in our study, as we come to these exhortations, we'll take time to study them out in better detail. The book of Hebrews is also a book of examination. What do we trust? Do we trust God's word or do we trust the word of the world? The destruction of Jerusalem was approaching as the Hebrew writer penned this letter. Jewish Christians would be scattered. They would need to be firmly grounded in the faith. Are we in similar circumstances today? Are we hanging on to the scaffolding of the church or are we safe within its doors? Are we established with grace, as the Hebrew writer says in chapter 13, verse 9? The book of Hebrews will help to determine where our faith really is. The book of Hebrews is also a book of expectation. Let's get our Bibles out and read some passages from the book of Hebrews. We've already read chapter 1 and verse 2. Let's read chapter 2 and verse 5. For it was not to angels that God subjected the world to come, of which we are speaking, and so there we see the world to come, the world to come which the Hebrew writer is speaking. That means it's, he's talking of a time beyond his time of writing. In chapter 9, in verse 15, Therefore Christ is the mediator of a new covenant, so that those who are called may receive the promised eternal inheritance, since a death has occurred, that redeems them from transgressions committed under that first covenant. And then finally, we'll read some verses from chapter 11, beginning in verse 10. Abraham was looking forward to the city that has foundations, whose designer and builder is God. By faith, Sarah herself received power to conceive even when she was past the age, since she considered him faithful who had promised. Therefore, from one man and him as good as dead were born descendants as many as the stars of heaven and as many as the innumerable grains of sand by the seashore. Verse 13. These all died in faith, not having received the things promised, but having seen them and greeted them from afar and having acknowledged that they were strangers and exiles on the earth. 
for people who speak thus make it clear that they are seeking a homeland. If they had been thinking of that land from which they had gone out, they would have had opportunity to return, but as it is, they desired a better country, that is, a heavenly one. Therefore, God is not ashamed to be called their God, for he has prepared for them a city. And jumping forward to verse 26, he considered the reproach of Christ greater than the wealth that the treasures of Egypt, for he was looking toward that reward. And in verse 26, the Hebrew writer is referring to Moses himself, a man who never was allowed to enter the promised land, but had to view it from afar, but still look forward to eternity with Christ. We, as Christians, are strangers and pilgrims here on this earth. We'll talk about that more when we get to chapter 11, verse 13. This life and its trappings are undependable. but We cannot become so heavenly-minded that we are no earthly good. Contrast the attitudes of Abraham and Lot. Who was truly secure, the tent dweller or the house dweller? Lot was saved, but he lost all of his possessions. Our earthly decisions must be motivated by our heavenly expectations. The writer expects his readers to be grown, or at least to be growing. A grown Christian can sort out the earthly from the heavenly. The Hebrew letter is also a book of exaltation, exaltation of the person and work of the Lord Jesus Christ. In this book of Hebrews, Jesus is shown to be superior to the prophets in his person. He's the very Son of God. He is God, according to chapter 1, verse 3, as the express image of his glory. Express image can also be interpreted exact imprint. Jesus is superior to the prophets in his work. He is the creator of the universe, as we see in verse 2 of chapter 1. Probably the most famous passage in the New Testament concerning this very point is John chapter 1, verses 1 through 5. In the beginning was the Word, and the Word was with God, and the Word was God. He was in the beginning with God. All things were made through him, and without him was not anything made that was made. In him was life, and the life was the light of men. The light shines in the darkness, and the darkness has not overcome it. And we'll stop reading there at the end of verse 5. Jesus is superior to the prophets in his person. He's superior to the prophets in his work. That leads us to this. Jesus is the superior prophet. Jesus, God the Son, and one Son. A final and complete message. The prophets, in contrast, were not God. They were men called by God. There was not just one prophet, there were many prophets, and they did not deliver a final and complete message, but an incomplete and fragmentary message. He is the prophet-priest, we see in chapter 1, verse 3. Jesus is also superior to the prophets in his kingship. It's he that sits on the right hand of God, and thus equal with God the Father. We'll close out this second lesson in the book of Hebrews by making two comments. Comment number one, Jesus is the creator, the prophet, the priest, and the king. No other prophet can make such a claim. Of no other person did God say, this is my beloved son, hear him. God said this to Moses and Elijah two of the greatest holy human prophets that ever lived. He said, this is my beloved son. Hear him, Moses and Elijah. 
This directly puts Jesus Christ superior to Moses or Elijah. And finally, we are not studying this book to lose ourselves in some of its intricate details or attack or defend some pet doctrine. We are studying this book because it contains God's will towards us and God's will for us. Thank you so much for studying with me today. I hope that you'll continue to study as we have 11 more lessons scheduled in this series when we're trying to post those once a week on Friday evenings at 7 p.m. That's what we're looking forward to doing. As I record this, it's April 2nd, uh, 2020, and Tonight at midnight, our state of Florida goes into lockdown mode because of the current distress of COVID-19. And I know that I'm keeping everyone out there in my prayers, and we would appreciate being in your prayers. If you would like to really help our channel, you can do that by subscribing, ringing the notification bell, giving the video a like or even a dislike and leaving a comment below all of those things help the channel also if you would be willing to share uh, this lesson or any of the lessons found on the channel with a friend a neighbor or loved one that also would help me grow this channel let's keep each other safe let's keep our distance and let's Continue to pray one for another till we meet again. May God bless.